All right, so this is our first lecture on thermal radiation. And in the chapter 12 on thermal radiation, it's all about just understanding the processes, some of the properties. And then when you get to chapter 13, it's thermal radiation as engineers solve and predict and make calculations. This is more theory and background. We won't get far today, but we'll talk a lot about uh, fluxes, intensity, radiation intensity, I. We'll talk about emission irradiation and radiosity hopefully uh, we will not get as far as this we'll get to there next time black body radiation let's jump into it let's say you have an object and the object is warm and the object is subjected to a cooler let me change color a cooler surroundings well in a vacuum you have you you don't even need any material complete vacuum, there will still be heat transfer from a hot object to a cooler object. Here I call it the surroundings. It's enclosing around that object. So what you'll have is you'll have photons or electromagnetic radiation which will be emitted off of that surface. So we talk about emission. Okay. Then the surroundings are above zero Kelvin, they're going to have some emission as well, but from the perspective of the object, what do you, that's another electromagnetic wave, that's an irradiation. What comes off of the surroundings is some of it goes and impinges and becomes irradiation on the object. So what we do is we have a little control volume and what we find is we find the balance. And if that object's hot and the surroundings are cool, the direction is known for the net radiative exchange. And we'll have Q, a symbol often used for that. It'll be a radiative, and it'll be the net radiative exchange. What will be the units on this Q rad net? Watts. Watts. So it's the rate of energy. It's transferred by thermal radiation from a hot object to a cooler object. Let's say we uh, want to employ or use lumped capacitance. Lumped capacitance, remember that? So what we have is we say the rate of change of the energy with respect to time of that object represented as the mass of the object, the specific heat of the object, the rate of change of the temperature of the object with respect to time. That's how it's, it's, it's increasing or decreasing. Well, it's going to be decreasing if it's a hot object, and it's equal to the negative of the net radiative exchange from that object to the surroundings. That look good? And then I think you could go ahead and solve a problem and solve for the temperature, maybe in Kelvin, of that object as a function of time, maybe in seconds or minutes, hours. And we start with a temperature, the temperature initial, and here's the temperature of the surroundings. Eventually, it's going to get down to the temperature of the surroundings, and it wouldn't be all that surprising of a curve. But it won't be a, net, a pure exponential curve because we know radiation depends on the net temperature, the absolute temperature to the fourth, fourth power, right? Through the Stefan-Boltzmann law. So thermal radiation can be very complicated. What is one of the complications? If you have it in gases, semi-transparent gas. Give me a, an example from your experience where there might be a semi-transparent gas. You're driving along and you run into a fog, thick pea soup fog, okay? Your headlights only shine so far, right? So somehow the photons coming off your headlights go out, reflect, and then back again. And, but they don't penetrate that far. So if somebody's shining headlights you know, at you at some distance in a fog, you can't see it because all the photons get gobbled up. So when you have uh, thermal radiation in a semi-transparent gas or a participating medium, 
then let's say I have a bunch of uh, a source right here and the photons are coming out, but some of them get gobbled up, gobbled up, gobbled up. It's, it's decaying as you go along the, the length of the beam of light because of the absorption. But then they can be emitted as well if it's truly a radiative participating medium. So it, it can be a volumetric phenomenon. For every little chunk of fluid, gas, you can have emission, you can have absorption, as well as transmission of the photons through it. That's too complicated, so we just um, describe it a little bit, but we really don't spend time analyzing that sy system here in this class. What do we spend time on? Thermal radiation between surfaces. What type of surfaces? Surfaces that don't transmit light through them. They're opaque. And so they absorb or reflect light that impinges on it. So the surface is here. If a photon comes, it's either absorbed or reflected. It's really not transmitted in an opaque surface. That's a surface phenomenon, and that's where we spend some time on. All right? So semi-transparent gases, they exist. They're important. Let's say a fireball in a furnace. That's a semi-transparent gas. Okay? The photons are emitted right in where the combustion's happening, but they don't all get to the exterior of that firebox. Well, we remember the dual nature of electromagnetic radiation. Do you remember that, physics? So you could describe the electromagnetic radiation as a wave phenomenon or by particles or packets or uh, photons. Now, we jump back and forth. Sometimes in this class, this chapter, we'll talk about the wavelength characteristic of it, and sometimes we'll talk about the photons. What's nice about the photons is they're like little BBs. They go in straight lines. Now, light can be curved and bent, but that's for astronomical dimensions and going around the surface of the sun, which is heavy mass object. No, in engineering applications here, most vast majority of calculations, you have to make the light travels in a straight line. It can be ref um, uh, reflected or it can be absorbed, but it's not going to change the path until there's some interaction. All right, so who remembers the relationship between the wavelength, lambda, and the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation? Well, the constant C is the speed of light. And who remembers the value of the speed of light? That's exactly it, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's the speed of light. You can also get the energy of a packet of photon, and that's H times nu. Well, what is H? Planck's constant. There it is. That's a number that I don't memorize. I don't have it. I just don't use it that often. I doubt anybody here does. So I didn't, well, here, I should have uncovered the box. And then, yeah, there it is, 3 times 10 to the 8. And then you can also express it by substituting. You get the Planck's constant speed of light divided by the wavelength. This is probably the more useful form because it shows you if you have a low wavelength, short wavelength packet of energy, talk about its energy. It's high. It's high. And long wavelengths uh, are lower energy than higher wavelength. I'm sorry, shorter wavelength. So this diagram, I'm going to build it up slowly, but it's in the textbook. Let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. First of all, we'll often talk about it in terms of lambda in, what is that unit? Micron. It's, that micron is 10 to the minus 6 meter. So it's the wavelength as a length okay, of the electromagnetic. In the entire... I'm just a se section of the electromagnetic spectrum. But you could have it 1 micron, you could have it 10 micron, 100 micron, 1,000, 10,000, down to 0.1, uh, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. I think that's the range that's shown in the textbook. 
That's a large variation. That's a large range of numbers, right? You just try to put your mind and, and grasp that, uh, how much of a range that is. Well, where is thermal radiation? And I hope this is one of the things that you'll leave this class with and years later you'll be able to recall and say, oh, I remember the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. I remember the wavelength range for thermal radiation. The range for thermal radiation, you, you have to you know, be told this, but it, it goes from 0.1 micron up to 100 micron. So that's the range of thermal radiation. Is there still energy transferred uh, for packets of electromagnetic radiation outside that range? Yeah, but what we're talking is the surface and it's naturally going to be emitting continuously because of the temperature of that surface. And if you have a low temperature, it's going to be emitting uh, weak energy or low energy packets in longer wavelength. And if you have a high temperature, it's going to be emitting shorter wavelength, higher energy packets. So that's the range of thermal radiation. Is that when you say infrared cameras, that's the wavelength it's reading? We're going to get to that. Yep, you're, you're right on track. You're following me. So as part of the thermal radiation spectrum from 0.1 to 100 micron, the visible range, what your human eye can see is completely in there but it's a very narrow slice. It's from 0.4 to 0.7. This is what your eye can see, roughly. Some people <coughs> say 0.75 micron, whatever. 0.8, I've quoted myself saying 0.4 to 0.8, 0.35, 0.8. You know, some 0.4 to 0.7 is good. All right, so this is visible. Um, so sometimes you can have a surface that will emit photons which your eye can see. Now in this room, if we shut off the lights, kill all the lights, right? Will there be anything in this room hot enough, high enough temperature that you will look over there and say, oh, it's glowing red? Nothing. It'll be completely uh, dark in this room. But you could be in a kitchen and there could be a kitchen stove and the heating element could be on. You take the pot off, you look at it, it's glowing red. Turn the light off on the switch, completely dark kitchen. Will you still see a red burner? It's because it's emitting in that wavelength. Now, don't touch the red burner because you know. <laughs> you know, isn't it hot? Yeah. So now there's an acronym to help us keep the, the color spectrum uh, in order, isn't it? And the, the 11 o'clock class, a lot of people, oh yeah, I understand Roy G. Biv. I've heard Roy G. Biv. I know Roy G. Biv, blah, blah, blah. So Roy G. Biv here is a nice little tool to help remember. I forget what they call that. So you spell it backwards. Roy, because we have it backwards here. G. Biv. What does R stand for? Red. Orange. Yellow and right in the middle of the visible spectrum is the color green. green, then blue, indigo, and violet. Blue, indigo, and violet. What are a lot of the colors of plants that you see, the leaves of plants? Green, green. right, very common out there. Let's say this, this uh, room temperature is around 300 Kelvin. Is the plastic, the wood, are these surfaces emitting photons right now in this room? Yes. Yep. And if they get hotter, they'll emit uh, stronger energy packets, shorter wavelength, and then maybe it could get so hot you could see it. But they're always emitting. They're always emitting. So out in this region, if you have something warm, it's be emitting, but you can't see it. It's not red so that it, I can see it. But it's out in the... IR region, longer wavelength, and it's called infrared. And I like it because it ties in this R with that R. Red, infrared. And then we all know that the sun is pumping out a lot of photons. 
And the sun, when you get the light down to the earth, what color is it? Is it the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet? Which color is the light from the sun? It's white because it's a whole spectrum, and it's pretty uniform throughout the spectrum, true? So the emission from the sun not only dumps a lot in the visible spectrum, but it dumps on both sides of the visible spectrum, and it dumps a lot of ultraviolet. Now, there, you can even have ultraviolet lower than 0.1, but there's just not a lot that's emitted from a hot surface because it's hot that's below 0.1. But there could be other things that generate light and then send it out with it that are in the ultraviolet region. Okay? Um, so x-rays, are x-rays generated be, by having something super hot? No, no, there's a different mechanism by which they generate the x-rays, true? And then the gamma rays, now all of these are parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's just that the thermal radiation is due to the hot surface and it's pumping out the photons. All right, so the green is about 0.55 micron. That's the color of the green. All right. Now we'll talk about spectral distribution and directional distribution. Both of these can be tongue twisters as well as conceptually challenging. So as a function of wavelength in microns, you can think about how the intensity of the energy is being emitted, the radiation, the emission, the radiative emission from that source. Well, what you will have, a lot of times, depending on the temperature of the source, it may be small and long wavelength, peak, and then come back down, something like that. So this radiative emission depends on the wavelength of interest. In this plot, if I said, what's the emission at this wavelength? Nothing, or negligible. What about this one? Oh, a lot. Most of it's being at that wavelength. How about out here? Well, very little. So you have the spectral distribution. It's sometimes called the spectral uh, emission. The spectral emission. Sometimes you'll even see the monochromatic emissive power or something like that. But it's how much of the energy is put out at that particular wavelength. What about this directional distribution? Well, here's my surface, and I'm interest, I can define a coordinate system where I have the perpendicular, that's the normal, and then the photons, there may be a lot of photons going straight up, and then fewer, 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 and you get a distribution that's shaped like this, trying to show you the directional characteristics. This is pretty simple. You say, there's a hot stove, it's, it's flat on the surface, I want to warm my hands with it, how would I orient my hands? Would I put them directly above, palm down, or would I put them at a shallow angle, palm down, or would I point my fingers at it at a shallow angle, or point my fingers at it down? I mean, you're going to put the palm down directly above. That's your experience, right? That will capture and warm your hands, capture more of the photons coming from that surface. So there's the directional distribution. How many or how much is going in that particular direction? It could be this direction of interest or that direction of interest or that direction, a very shallow angle direction of interest. Well, there's a bunch of radiative fluxes. And a lot of times, there's so many fluxes, this word gets forgotten or omit, omitted. And you just talk about a radiative power. But when you look at it, it's per unit area. So the first one is, is E, cap E. And it has units of watts per meter squared. Well, what is this? This is the emission or emissive power. All right. And so if it's watts per meter squared, it's the amount of radiation, thermal radiation, being emitted from that surface in all directions. We just talked about the directional characteristic. And over all 
wavelengths. That seems pretty simple. Here's another radiative flux, G. What's G? It's just the opposite of emission. It's irradiation. What's irradiation? That's not outgoing because of emission. It's incoming because there's neighbors. So watts per meter squared. Typical G, units for G, irradiation. What is, it's in all directions. It's not just only coming from that angle or this angle over here, but they're all directions coming in and all wavelengths. There's another flux, J. Okay, this is easy, but then it gets hard. Radiosity is the name of J. What are the units? watts per meter squared and what exactly is it well it's the net outgoing all directions all wavelengths hold it i think we already had outgoing what which is closest to j e or g in definition E because it's emission but how wh why do we have a separate why is not J equal to E because we focus on a surface and you have the emission that's E coming out and then you have what's coming in G for an opaque surface one of two things can happen to the photons when they when they're coming into the surface G they can either do this or that? What are the two things? Be absorbed. Absorbed. The absorbed photons, will they contribute to the net outgoing? No. But what about the reflected photons? They will contribute to the net outgoing. So the uh, reflected, if you, if you have the absorptivity is the fraction that's absorbed, and they're either absorbed or not absorbed, then 1 minus the absorptivity is the fraction that's reflected. And we multiply that by the incoming G. So guess what J is? The combination, it's the emission plus 1 plus, no, 1 minus. Uh, emission plus 1 minus the absorptivity times the irradiation. That's J, the radiosity. That's the net Outgoing. Why do they say net? Well, some of it's due to the emission, some of it's due to the radiation. There's another symbol that can be confusing. Q double prime rad. All right, what units? Watts per meter squared. Do you know sometimes units can really help you distinguish between what you're talking about and then sometimes not, right? Look at that, they all have the same units. But what is this net radiative flux? And it'll be between the leaving surface and then the, and, uh, um, like we did it for the uh, surroundings, right? It was leaving surface to the surroundings or participating with the surroundings. So that was a net flux based on the area of the emitter or the surface of interest. All right. Oh, here's a breakdown of those, but it's in the textbook. Well, to do a good job of thermal radiation, you have to get a good grip on the geometry. How many people uh, recall uh, what the definition of a uh, plane angle is in 2D? So you come out with a dot, you come out with a radius R, and then you swing that through an arc, angle alpha, and that angle alpha is the plane angle. What is the definition of alpha? How do you remember the definition of alpha? A 
if, if I just tell it to you, you go, uh huh, yeah, I see you're half sleeping. Some got their heads way down, they're all completely sleeping. But what is the definition? How many people have used angles and calculations and engineering? Tons of times. What are we talking about? A plane angle. It's not tricky, just what is the definition of the plane angle? Somebody says, this angle goes from here to here. And then they ask you, okay, tell me, for that case, what's alpha? Most of you can tell me. You don't need to consult a textbook. What's alpha in this case? 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. True or false? All right, so what is that angle? How do we get it? Are you lost? There's, I don't want to give it to you. Think about it. Because then we're going to get to the 3D angle. And it's the same concept, just extrapolated to 3D. Got it. He's got it right there. It's a ratio of two things, two lengths, two lengths. One is the arc length. What do you mean arc length? This length right here, L. It's not a straight line length. It's an arc length. It's a curved length. Divided by the other length, what is R? The radius, see, you're, you're arcing from that point, R out. So SI unit of arc length, meter. SI unit of R, radius, meter. So what's the dimension on alpha? Completely dimensionless, but we put in and say, hoo, it's in radian. But radian is dimensionless, true or false? All right. So a lot of times we'll then go back and forth between radians and uh, degrees. Well, let's now move to 3D. I feel like that was not so good in 2D, so I'll just tell you in 3D. How's that? Is that easier? But it's the same pattern. You take a point right here, and you go out R, and then you think about a little cone that's close around R, and now that cone has an angle, let's say a very small, like d omega, or d alpha, or you could just call it omega, it's the small, think of a small. And then out here, what do we have? We have a little area, d a. It's a little ice cream cone shaped area because it is a little contour, it's not flat. It's like the arc length wasn't a flat line, was it? And uh, you say to yourself, hmm, what do you think is the solid angle, omega? It's a solid angle. It's the ratio of two things. What would be analogous to the arc length? Yeah, that little area, that DA, and it's a little curved area at the, at the end of that cone. And then I have to divide it by something because this is meter squared. Sometimes units will help. What do you think? I need to divide it by something meter squared. R squared. And so there it is. That's your solid angle in three dimensions. So somebody says, uh, I have uh, a point here, and it's on a plane. There's a fl you know, plane. And I'm thinking about the complete angle above the plane. That would be a hemisphere. Is it not a hemi hemisphere? Half of a half of a sphere? Hemisphere? So in the hemisphere, how much how many stair radians? How much how how much is the solid angle? I forgot to emphasize that is that just like these are radians for 2D. The angle is measured in stair radians. Stair radians in solid angles, true? Okay, so for stair radians, how many stair radians are in the hemisphere? It's uh, 2 pi. 
How about this, if we go back to here, how many radians are in the arc that goes half of a circle? Pi. Pi. All right. All right. All right. So there is a good review, hopefully, of the solid angles. Now, we're going to deal with spherical coordinate systems. So uh, what is R in a spherical coordinate system? Radial distance. Often we put the spherical coordinate system in context of a Cartesian x, y, z, right? So if I come out to a point there, what is from the origin straight line out, that's R. Sometimes the book will use symbol rho. Some books will use rho. And then we have another angle, phi. That's, this is my symbol for phi and theta. If I project this point down onto the xy plane, right here it is, and I draw a line straight out to that projection on the xy plane, then the angle right here is phi. And then the other angle, theta, is a polar angle, and it's from the x-axis directly toward it, theta. So R, I'm sorry, did I say X? It's Z axis, Z axis, polar axis, perpendicular to the XY plane. So uh, different names for these, you could have the theta is a polar angle, theta is a zenith angle, there's a bunch of different variations, but polar angle most people will grasp, and phi would be some azimuthal angle or orthogonal projection angle onto the xy plane, just as long as we have it defined correctly. So that's our coordinate system. You have the point defined as r, phi, and theta. So if we take and uh, think about um, uh, varying theta, right? If I vary theta for a constant r and a constant phi, what do I get? A little arc right out here, right? What will be the length of that arc? If, if I just vary theta. R d theta, wouldn't it be? R d theta, does, does the v come into play on that length? No. And then if I leave phi alone and just vary, th I'm sorry, leave theta alone and vary phi, then it would be like moving this way. Right? It's as if the distance that's here, this is R sine of theta, it would be the same as this distance perpendicular out right there, and then arcing it through. So the little product of those gives you a little area, and so dA is the product R d theta times r sine theta d phi. Do you remember that? So that gives me the area. So somebody says, uh, um, uh, what it get is relationship between a little angle d omega, a little solid angle d omega? Well, it would be that area d a at the end when I'm not changing r, I'm just changing phi and theta, divided by r squared. What is dA? We just worked it out. It's r squared sine of theta d theta d phi divided by r squared. And so the, uh, the solid angle uh, is equal to the d, 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 uh, solid angle d omega is sine of theta d theta d phi. Let's do it. We just said that a hemisphere has a total solid angle of 2 pi, stair radians, right? Well, let's do this. Sum of all the little solid angles, d omegas, over the hemisphere. But to do that integration over the hemisphere, I'm going to do a double area or double coordinate, double integration. It's going to be... Um, with it'll be sine of theta d theta d phi. And so the first 
integration is with respect to theta. Look at that illustration and you, I'm going to pause and walk around. You tell me what are the limits on the integration for the first integral for theta and then what are the limits on the second integral for phi, right? Do you understand the question? All right, who wants to volunteer for the limits on theta? Zero to pi. Theta is this one, right? Does it go? Zero to pi over two or zero to pi? It's hemisphere, not the total sphere. It's only to the xy plane, right? So what is the limit? Got it, pi over two. Who wants the new volunteer? Got it. Zero to two pi. Every now and then somebody will say, let's go negative pi to positive pi. Well, let's just start at zero and not be symmetric around zero. Just zero to, to two pi, true? All right, very good. Do you think you could do this integration and prove to yourself it's two pi stair radians in a hemisphere? Good. All right. Well, let me stop here. I'll pick up there next time. Thank you.